Okay, this is part two to lecture five, where we look at some examples of vector spaces. The easy example of a vector space is the set of real numbers. So when we when I say vector space, what I want you to think of is remember how we said there was a a set V, that's the set of vectors, and a set F, which is the set of scalars. So V is the set of vectors. And uh, F is the set of scalars. The scalars come in when there's scalar multiplication. The, the vectors are throughout. So when we say vector spaces, we really are talking about V. And most times, the set of scalars is just the real numbers already. So when I say the set of real numbers, I mean V being the set of real numbers. The vectors are real numbers. They satisfy all 10 axioms. As we were going through the axioms, they all seem to make sense from our notion of numbers. And so the set of real numbers is our first idea of a vector space. And then with that, we can take ordered pairs. We can take the R2, it's called, the, the plane, the XY plane. The set of all ordered pairs of real numbers. All the, all the uh, 10 axioms will hold there as well. No need to be restricted just to two dimensions. In, in general, we can go to Rn, which is the set of all, um, instead of saying ordered triples and ordered four, um, four um, ordered, we'd say just n tuples. And so that, that is an ordered n tuple is n components of an ordered pair um, where, it, and just like R2. And so nothing would, stop us from being able to say that if it works for R, then we put two of them, it's going to work for R2. We just write them as ordered pairs. If we put N of them, it's going to work for Rn. We just write them as what we call N tuples. No need to be restricted just to real numbers. We can go to complex numbers as well. And everything, as far as the 10 axioms, will hold. And so we call that uh, Cn, generically. That's uh, the set of all complex N tuples. And, and C, we could take C by itself, or C2, or, um, but we'll just say C in, in general. This is an interesting vector space. It's called P sub N. Now, the N will stand for the degree, the highest degree polynomial that you're allowing. And P sub N will be the set of all polynomials of that degree or lower. And so less than or equal to N, degree less than or equal to N. And we're going to take a close look at this. We're going to actually go through and show all 10 axioms for P2. That'll be on the next um, couple slides. Next up is the set of all generic M by N matrices. We've been dealing with matrices up until this point. They actually form what we call a vector space. All the 10 axioms, the five addition axioms, and the and the five scalar multiplication axioms hold for any generic size matrix. It doesn't have to be a square matrix. A special um, subspace of that, we have to talk about what a subspace is, but a special subspace of that would be your square matrices. And that is also a vector space. So we call them vectors, the set of vectors, but we've seen that they can be real numbers, they can be polynomials, they can be matrices. They're not our general notion of, of vectors. And as long as those 10 properties hold, when you throw in the, um, the set of real numbers as your scalars, then what you have is a vector space. And then one more, the, the set of continuous functions defined on a closed interval a, b. We're talking about single variable functions that are continuous, but even more than that, they have at least k continuous derivatives. So the k that's up here, as in that sort of exponent type position, that'll stand for how many continuous derivatives we expect them to have. All these guys are vector spaces, and we'll take P2 and look at it in detail. Go through all 10 axioms. In order to show something's a vector space, you have to show the axioms hold. So here we go. P2 is the set of all real valued polynomials of degree 2 or less. 
and then F is going to be our scalar, uh, real, our real scalars. And standard addition and multiplication, we're talking about adding vectors the standard kind of way, adding polynomials the standard kind of way of adding polynomials, uh, multiplying a polynomial by a number. Scalar multiply would be just multiplying a polynomial by a number the scalar way. Let's look at it in detail. So we call them vectors, air quotes, but they really are polynomials of degree at most two. Okay, let's take a look at that. What is was an example of that? So we'll call it P, and we have um, quadratic or lower polynomials. So we have A2 times X squared, and A1 times X, and A0 as a generic vector, a generic polynomial in our vector space. We're going to show it's a vector space, um, and we need to have those coefficients, A0, A1, and A2, be real numbers. Okay, so that's our generic vector and then adding would be adding two of those guys would be adding the like terms squares with squares x's with x's and constants with constants here's an example of that I have a vector p i have a polynomial p i have a vector q and then we take two of these guys and we add them together and we're just adding component wise a2 and b2 get added because they're both the coefficient on x squared and so on so it's standard addition adding polynomials and standard multiplication. You take a number times a polynomial, the number is k, and you multiply it by your generic polynomial p, and all you do is just put the k on each com on each on each term. So your coefficient changes by a factor of k. So standard addition and uh, standard multiplication. And we're going to show all ten axioms hold. Okay, it's a laborious process, but Let's go through it. Okay, so we're going to have three generic guys, P, Q, and R, to be our polynomials. And then we're going to have real real numbers as coefficients, uh, real numbers as scalars. So let's go with the five addition axioms. First up is closure under addition. If I take two polynomials and add them together that are P2, that are polynomials of degree 2 or less, am I always guaranteed to have a polynomial of degree 2 or less? And we've seen how the addition works. And so this is definitely a polynomial of degree 2. Adding P and Q together. That doesn't get you out of this space of polynomials of degree 2. It's not possible to add two of these guys and end up with something that's not one of these guys. Secondly, who, who cares the order? You should be able to add them in any order. If I add polynomials, I should take P and Q and should be, be able to add it in reverse order. Q and P. <clears throat> we call that commutativity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I have this P plus Q and I reverse it, I can reverse those A's and B's, those coefficients, and I get Q plus P. So here's what you would think uh, th this axiom holds. We just have to go through each one. Next up, the associativity property. If I take three of these guys and add the first two called P and Q and then later add R, I could have added the second two, Q and R. And then add P. It's what you would think. That's all on the coefficient level with real numbers. And so if it works for real numbers, it's going to work for these polynomials. All the action is happening on these coefficients. And so I take P and Q and then add R. That just gives me all three, A, B, and C. But then I can just use the associativity for real numbers and move those parentheses over. So the associativity that works with the real numbers will then allow me to then use the associativity for the polynomials. This is rewritten as P and then later Q plus R. P plus Q plus R. So it's not a normal question to ask you to have to go through all 10. Um, what's a more interesting question is show when it doesn't work or actually use a stranger definition of addition and multiplication and we'll do that later but let's finish this out so uh, the fourth addition axiom is to make sure that you have an additive identity okay I want to put air quotes around the zero because it might not be exactly our notion of zero here it is so there's a zero out there there's a zero polynomial out there it's the polynomial where the coefficients are all zero okay and I, when I add that to any polynomial I'll just get that polynomial back and so for sure, then we have a zero 
an additive identity, an air quote zero. All right, and then finally, the fifth property is that, well, to get to that additive identity, I must have my inverse, my additive inverse. There must be a guy negative P out there for every P that's out there. And, of course, it is because it's on the coefficient level um, for every for every coefficient, A0, A1, and A2, there's the opposite of that coefficient in the real number level. And so we have negative A2 and negative A1 and negative A0. And when we add these, of course, we get 0 for every coefficient and so we get the zero which is the art what we call the additive identity so everyone has an additive inverse to get you back to that additive identity and all those properties um, of, of addition hold so we're halfway done now let's move to the other half scalar multiplication axioms if I scale any polynomial do I still get a polynomial of degree 2 or less yeah sure it just changes the coefficient so K um, times any random polynomial, we'll just put k's on each coefficient, it still is a polynomial of degree 2 or less. It's not like we're going to lose the squared term or, or even get a higher exponent term. When I add two polynomials first and then scale, I should be able to scale each of the polynomials and then add. We call that the distributive property. So here's that written up. Um, we saw the addition of, of, the, of the two, P and Q. We said already that, that it looks like what's in the square brackets here. And then, you know, the K just multiplies inside. And what we do is we distribute the K. So everything that's working on the real number level, working for the coefficients, is now working basically three different times for the polynomial on the constant term, on the X term, and on the squared term. And so we scale those. And then we break it up. And therefore that gives us back to having the scaled version of P plus the scaled version of Q. All right. It's, it's tough to write up all this, but it's not difficult. It's just a matter of just go, going through it. If you have two numbers added together and then want to scale, you can scale um, by each one and then later add. That's another form of distributive property. And it's just because it works on the coefficient level. It's like three copies of R3. I mean, three copies of the real numbers. Everything is working in the real number level, and we do it three different times for this polynomial. And so we can distribute across, and then we could break it up and distribute, and then we have it back to, uh, oh, it should say that this is, I don't know, it doesn't say it on here. Let me write it. This is equal to, um, this is equal to KP. This is equal to KP plus CP. All right, great. All right, two more to go. Um, this is your associative property. You can um, multiply the scalars together first and then scale the polynomial. Or you could scale the polynomial by the C and then later multiply by the K. So we start with the, the left hand. We, we basically put the C on each one, and it's, it's what we would think. All right, and lastly... There needs to be a scalar out there that when you multiply by any polynomial, you get the polynomial back, air quote one, um, and, and there is the scalar one will do it for you. Um, one times P will give you P. So there are the uh, 10 axioms shown for the world of P2, the vector space P2. P2 is a vector space. But what we had seen along the way was that it really is kind of like we kept using R. And so what we can say, well, we will be able to eventually, is that these two spaces, P2 and R3, we had three copies of R. It was working on the constant level, it was working on the X level, it was working on the X squared level. What we're gonna say is that these two spaces are related to each other, and we'll give that a name later. So that's the end of this video, and we come back and we look at some some vector, some things that you would think to be a vector space that aren't. We'll look at some properties of vector spaces, and then we'll finish up with uh, some strange definition of addition and subtraction, and what that leads to um, with vector, with, with with the ten axioms, with with some of the ten axioms. Okay.